Hello, everyone. Welcome to an edition of Talking Cinema with Julius Freeman and Sean Malone. James is not here tonight. Um, he had a, a prior engagement, so he'll be joining us when we move the show, which, by the way, we have to talk about Sean, you and I. And what day of the week, next week, we're going to move the show, so that way we can make it official. Um, you could do it. You could let me know on the uh, private uh, comment. You don't, have to let, you don't have to announce it yet until we, you know, I guess, agree, because you're the last one that uh, we're waiting on. Last man standing. Day. Yeah, last man standing. Uh, but yeah, he's not here uh, with us this week because, like I said, he has a prior engagement. But he will be joining us the next uh, episode, which will be underrated and overrated directors, volume two. So, uh, oh yeah, uh, stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned for that one. Uh, that one's gonna be a, another good episode because we're gonna probably surprise each other once again of the list that we make as to who's underrated and overrated in terms of uh, directing. So tonight, Sean and I decided to to change and, and switch things up a little bit by uh, not talking too much about cinema. Um, talking si something else. Talking sitcoms. Sitcoms is, uh, and still is, it has been, a staple in American culture. It started with I Love Lucy in the 50s, I believe, right? Am I right or wrong in that assessment? I want to say late 50s, yeah. Yeah, I should really so, know this stuff. Yeah, television was set up what in the 40s was that's when it was kind of starting to take off. So the 40s yeah. was the time when you know it was new, it was new technology. The industry was growing, they really didn't know what they had yet. The only thing they did know was they had airtime to sell the products. That's the only thing that <laughs> was for sure was that corporations and companies were like, finally, we could have we could sell our product to more people, advertise to more people. Um, but, of course, it can't just be all advertising because it'd be extremely boring. So they had to fill it with stuff. And um, that that meant uh, uh, programs like Craft, like the Craft, I think it was called the... Uh, hold on, let me see here. The Craft the Television craft, Theater. The Craft, craft television, television Theater. Theater, yeah, which was an anthology drama where a lot of people got their start. A lot of uh, people who later became famous got their start, you know... Um, uh, James Dean is listed as one in, in, on there. Um, Rod Serling was a writer there. Patty Shievsky, and we, we, we spoke about Patty Shievsky for Network. Uh, Paul Newman, um, all sorts of actors who later became big started here in the craft television uh, theater, uh, uh, mystery theater, or the, or the drama theater, whatever you want to call it. And it was very successful. But that was the beginning of like, okay, well, this is new. This is fresh. You know, let's, let's see where we can go from here. And then Eventually, comedy came into the picture, and um, I think uh, is I Love Lucy the first of its kind. Um, to my knowledge, right. well, it's the first. It's the first multi-camera sitcom. I know that for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. That's I don't right. know. It's there. There might be some pioneering um, other shows that that have the sitcom format, but not but not the multi-camera sitcom format. Um, oh, the Honeymooners. That's right. The Honeymooners right. is a comedy, and right. that was that. That was a single camera uh, show, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, and actually, let's check the date on that. Cause... To the moon, Alice. To the moon. Okay, so so I Love Lucy <laughs> was 1951 to 1957. Okay, six uh, years. The, That's a good run. The Honeymooners was 55 to 56. Oh, okay. Um, surprisingly, so was... It was only on the air for a year. There's only 40 episodes of it. Wow, I never knew uh, that. Yeah, and the reason for that, I know the reason why. It's because the star of the show, um, Jackie Jack Gleason? Gleason. Yeah, he didn't want to do any more than one year because he didn't. He was a type of, which is my kind of guy, by the way. This is the kind of guy I like, the kind of artist that I like. Uh, he didn't want to burn out the show. He said that I had a story, I had an idea. This is what I want to say at this point in my life, but I didn't want to do it for, for years and years and years. I just want to do it for this one time because I wanted to get out of my system because obviously it's based off his upbringing in uh, ghetto New York as a child. So there was some uh, connection there to his childhood, which is why it made, it was a lot more funnier because he, he came from that, uh, from mm -hmm. that world. And so he, he was the type of artist that I like, which is, 
he was on it for a while and then he's like, I'm done. I did what I had to say and I'm going to move on to something else. And that's why his career spanned the way it did. And that's why he's so revered even to this day. Like even I know who Jack Cleason is and he's way before my time. Um, and, he's, and he's immortalized in uh, the Back to the Future film. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's, he's immortalized in the Back to the Future cartoon. Uh, now we can watch Jackie the- Gleason while we eat. Yeah. <laughs> I know this one. It's a rerun. What's, What's a rerun? A rerun? <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Honeymooners, I, I, maybe that was that the first one? I, I don't even know what the... No, I love Happy Lucy. Jam Jam. I Love Lucy Zoom. was 1951. Honeymooners was 55. So. Oh, 55. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so so I guess it's safe to say that I Love Lucy was the first of its kind. That's always been my understanding. Um, okay. You know, you mentioned last time that Lucy, she came from a theater background and yes. her husband, Desi Arnaz, they were creative partners and business partners, and he wanted... Uh, her wishes to be fulfilled, which she wanted to be able to perform like she was in theater um, in front of an audience. And she didn't want to do take after take after take. And so they developed this way of filming the show, uh, which was like, you know, a large set with multiple rooms uh, that was, you know, well, that was basically everything was lit already. And there were, there were multiple, uh, (laughs) Oh, come on, Happy Jam Jam. That's you're 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 canceled, Happy Jam Jam. Um so there was um so th- there was that innovative aspect to it, right? And filming with multiple cameras. Another thing yeah. that Lucy was ahead of her time on was um, you know, she wanted to film the show on film. She wanted to make sure they shot it on 35 millimeter film. Um, and not just do the, and I forget what the, <laughs> I should probably know these things, but there was, uh, there was a way for them to transmit a, a broadcast signal, you know, through the, through the camera, um, that didn't involve actually filming it. Right. And creating a camera oh, right. negative. Yeah, um, right. and then it would just be broadcast, but then, and then there was a machine that would film basically what was being broadcast. Um, and that would be sort of the archive or the record, but it was based, it was literally like a film camera pointed at a screen that would then film what was being broadcast. Lucy didn't want to do it that way because you lost a lot of fidelity and quality by filming just the broadcast off of the screen. And she wanted to film the show on 35 millimeter film and then broadcast it. And then of course she was like thinking way ahead because that was what in, enabled the, the show not only to still look great today, but to be syndicated and to be seen um, by so many people. Um, and yeah, to be syndicated and shown over and over and over and over again. So yeah, this is the cast. Um, I, uh, Fred and Fred and Ethel always cracked me up. Yeah. Um, I do great. know that uh, the, the actors, uh, Vivian Vance, uh-huh. She was very jealous of Lucille Ball because apparently Vivian Vance wanted the role of Lucy. She wanted to be the star of the show. And she was a, a, a great comedic actress in her own right as well. But, I mean, Lucille Ball was one of these, one of these actresses who just... It, it's like what they call it in the industry, right? She just had it. She just had, she had it. And there's just no way you could outshine her because of how talented and skilled not only was she talented she was also skilled in her comedic time and like she knew exactly what to do and how to do it in the right way so that way she could get the genuine authentic laughter from the live audience that was it live audience the first season or did they did they start doing that after the first um, season to my understanding it was always a live audience it was always um, live audience right yeah that makes sense you know, another story i've always heard about i love lucy is that you know they're they're kind of one of the first interracial couples on TV, right? Yeah, like that's right. Um, because he's Cuban American and she's um she's white. So right. um and somebody had said to her, Well, you can't put that on TV, no one will believe it. And um, like no one will believe that a white lady would be married to this Cuban guy, you know. <laughs> and right, right. And Lucy's response was uh, well, it's reality. Like, why wouldn't they believe it? Like we are married in real life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, um, exactly. 
And you know, for the most part, people didn't really care. Really. Oh yeah. No, I, I don't think it was, uh, they never made a big deal. Of course, you know, he had his band and he played the nightclubs right. and, and they kind of made a, they made jokes about him. Whenever he got angry with her, he would yell at her in Spanish, you know? Um, right. So that you know, they integrated that aspect into the humor, but it was never an issue in the show. Like um, everyone just accepted Ricky as you know, yeah, he's this successful musician, and they're married, you know. And also, it, I think it also helped that even though he had the heavy accent, um, he played well off of off his wife, and also he it it also helped that he was light skinned as well. I think because oh, <laughs> I, yeah. I think if he was uh, an african cuban i don't think it would I, I think people are like nah we're not doing well, that sure yeah so uh i know it was a different time and um that's just the way it was so it's not uh please don't cancel lucy because <laughs> i like i love lucy and um uh, it's just the way it is guys but yeah i think that helped too the fact that he at least looked the part maybe sure. he didn't speak it but he looked the part and i think that's what helped a lot with for for the producers to be like, okay, let's let's pull the trigger on this, and it ended up being a uh, a massive success oh. from what I hear. Go back one. That's um, Carl Freund. He's the this cinematographer guy. that developed ah, the. Okay, okay. I was wondering who's this guy. <laughs> yeah, he he's a great cinematographer. He actually shot movies like Frankenstein and. Um, oh, uh, okay. So he was like block. Yeah, he 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 had a beautiful artistic style and he developed this kind of more flat comedic lighting for the I love Lucy show that is still used in sitcoms today. Like, you know, you watch any sitcom from, well, even like you watch a modern sitcom, like um, last man standing or something like that. They use very similar um, foundations for how they light the set. Now, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. Is a show like American family considered a sitcom considering that it's not in front of a live audience that it's actually shot like, a drama, you know, where there's no live audience. It's a, it's like a film essentially. Is, Do you is mean Modern it? Family? Do you mean what Modern Family? It? What did I call it? American Family. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Modern Family. I'm thinking of another show. So those are known as single camera sitcoms. Um, you know, the idea of a sitcom is a situation comedy. Like you're going to, um, you're going to put a group of characters in a situation, and then you're going to mine comedy from it. Um, you know, like there's always a premise to a sitcom. Like, for instance, like who's the boss? You know, the premise is, oh, this like retired ball player goes to be a nanny for this like professional right. woman. Right. And then literally like seven or eight seasons of just that um, of, of mining comedy out of that situation. Um, so, yes, it's absolutely a sitcom. It's just shows like Modern Family, Arrested Development. Um, um, 30 Rock, they're all known as single camera sitcoms. Um, oh, okay. And actually, Arrested Development was, and th there are other s single camera sitcoms before Arrested Development, but Arrested Development was definitely like a trendsetter. Like after Arrested Development came out, you saw a lot more single camera sitcoms come out because it was right. such a popular show. Yeah. But, but yeah, this gentleman, Carl Freund, if you're watching, uh, look him up. He's, he's a real uh, accomplished artist so essentially he was the the godfather of of what we know today as a as a sitcom yeah on, i mean multiple cameras you know not you know the lights set up in a certain way it's i guess standardized ways now nowadays would be would be known as and they actually show up on set and they shoot and they do their thing is that is that my understanding yeah because like he's really known for pioneering the lighting and how they lit the sets and right it's like if you're shooting a film, a dramatic film, you're going to light a scene and everything's about that scene, like where the blocking is in the scene, where the actors are in the scene. Carl Freund developed this lighting system that was just like, I'm going to light this entire set, right? The kitchen, the bedroom, the dining room, the, and then actors can just move freely within that space. You know, um, there wasn't a real need to like adjust. Well, I don't know. I wasn't on the set of I Lose, of Lucy, but there would be less of a need to adjust for, for blocking and, and things like that. Cause everything was just like kind of pre-lit. Um, so that's my understanding as to what his contribution was, but, but the reason we're doing this show isn't necessarily to talk about all the technical stuff. Um, but just because uh, Julius and I were like, Hey, let's talk about sitcoms. Like he had sitcoms that he grew up with that he loved. Right. I had sitcoms that I grew up with that I loved. 
And, and then also a few years ago, I just got, I've grown to love sitcoms more and more. I actually view them as like a great American art form. I used to look at them as like, kind of like low brow, like they're not really artistic, you know, <laughs> they're just right. kind of like, you know, low hanging fruit, cheap humor, you know, that kind of thing. And I've really grown um, over the years to appreciate it as its own art form and realize that um, it's, it's a very American, it's like musical theater or jazz. It's a very American uh, art form. Yeah. So, so Absolutely. Julius, I, what, I what, 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 um, we're going to do a lightning round if I may. Okay. Go for so, it. um, if you can name two sitcoms, we already talked about I Love Lucy. I think that takes care of the fifties for us. Okay. Name two sitcoms from the sixties that you like. The sixties that yeah. I like. Wow. You know, you do one, I'll do one. And then. Yeah. Gosh, I don't think I have one. You I told me one before we went on the air. You said the star of it was cute. Oh, Bewitched. That's right. Bewitched was okay. All right. All right. I had to I had to go I had to go back there. Bewitched was was one one of my favorites, Nick and Knight. You know, when Nickelodeon played reruns after nine o'clock, they would they would play reruns of old shows after nine after eight o'clock or nine o'clock. I can't remember which the, what time it was. Oh but yeah, man. Nick and Knight. Love yeah, Nick and Knight was was my go-to at night because I would stay up later than normal and my parents would not care. <laughs> so as long as I didn't stay over because you're like o'clock. Yeah, eleven o'clock. Then I was I was okay because I still woke up in, to go to school anyway. I didn't I didn't drag my feet in the morning, oh. so I think they, they allowed me to to stay up late because oh he he still gets up, and so that's why they let me stay up late. Um, but yeah, Nick and I for sure. Uh, yeah, Bewitched. Uh, as I we talked earlier, uh, the reason why I liked that show it wasn't so much that I thought it was funny. It was more because I liked looking at at the Elizabeth star of the Montgomery. Show. Yeah, Elizabeth <laughs> Montgomery. She was. Very easy to look at, even as a young as a young man, a young preteen. I was like, "Wow, this! I just can't stop looking at this yeah, woman." Yeah, she's a pretty. I can't. Pretty lady. I can't stop looking at her, and I and I don't know why she wasn't such a a bigger star in Hollywood in terms of mm. movies and and what have you. But I mean, how can you not? Hold on, let me let me find the picture. How can you not love? Yeah, this face. This, this face. Yeah, she's how a beauty. Can you, how can you not like? watch the well, show and you'd be like i, I don't want to watch the show because you you know this is this this i don't like looking at her but i mean just look at that this is just like a mesmerizing, mesmerizing my uh face. I, my dad you know he talked my you know my dad grew up in this era so he was like oh yeah elizabeth montgomery she was real cute you know and yeah. um and it's funny because like i had a crush on her too because my dad watched her like in real time when he was a kid i watched oh, okay. her when i was watching nick at night Right. For me, Nick at Night was more of a um, summertime thing where I where right. I was allowed yeah. to stay up late. <laughs> but it was funny because like I don't my parent my parents didn't care at all. I I don't think because it was summer. I didn't have to go to school right. the next day, and plus I was watching like all these wholesome like sitcoms from yeah, like, right, the Dick right. Van Dyke Show and stuff like that. So they weren't like worried about what I was watching. Um, so Dick Van Dyke Show was another great one from that era. Um, did you watch uh, that one, Dick, Julius? I, I didn't watch uh, Dick Van Dyke. Um, I, I didn't really like it. Okay. I, although yeah. I will say, I don't know if it was 60s. It might have been 60s. But I did love the Andy Griffith show. Uh, oh, I don't okay. know if Andy Griffith was a 60s I think, show or not. I think Andy Griffith was late 50s, early 60s, late but 50s. we should look it up. Um, yeah, let, let me, I want to share this with you real quick. And I'll look up the Andy Griffith show. I wanted to uh, to show this real 60, quick. Sixty through sixty-eight. Sorry to interrupt okay. you. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. So yeah, that was that was one show that I did like. I did enjoy because it, it was very. Uh, not only was it wholesome, but I liked a lot of the uh, the lessons they had in that show. It was very. It seemed very down down to earth for me. Like something like I could relate to as a. Oh, okay. As a Latino boy, even if, even though Andy Griffith is not or like, there's no personal color in that show. It's all white people, but the values of their family values and and like the stories and the lessons, I could identify with that with that because that's universal stuff. You know, that's you know characters going through like you know children growing up and dealing with certain things, and of course Andy Griffith being the wise, you know, um, 
father well, figure. Sheriff. He was a sheriff, right? He was he was a sheriff, if I remember correctly. Of and Barney town? Fife, man. With that Barney one. Fife, man. <laughs> he only huh? had that one bullet. And he was a single dad. Oh. He was a single dad as well. So that it was like a close to that was close to my surrounding because I, I I even though I wasn't raised by a single parent, I had some friends who were raised by single parents. So that's why mm. it was it was a bit more I connected with a bit more with that, even mm. though it was totally like like foreign to me. But like I said, mm. the universality of it was the the lessons in the show. So that that was one of my other favorites. I my my grandparents liked the Andy Griffith show a lot. And um I remember watching it. I wasn't one of my the ones I got obsessed with or, or watched yeah. a lot, but um, but yeah, Barney Fife, uh, Don Knotts, yeah, was, he was great <laughs> in that show. Yeah, forget um, about Opie either. Forget, oh, yeah, long gotta long love Opie. <laughs> Ron Howard, <laughs> gotta love little Ronnie Howard, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, but can can you show this Dick Van Dyke picture real quick? Sure, so. Dick Van Dyke show is one of my favorite shows. And I just, I don't know, maybe it's because it was like a showbiz show. It was one of those like uh, behind right. the scenes showbiz shows. Like, and, and I love 30 Rock. It's like my favorite show ever. So Dick Van Dyke show, I think is like a pre, 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 pre <laughs> 30 Rock. Um, right, where right. They, they work for this kind of crazy, you know, variety show, talk show host, Alan Brady, played by the brilliant Carl Reiner. Um, and they have that gag. There's this great gag where uh, Alan Brady, it turns out one episode you find out he's bald and he wears wigs. And <laughs> um, and he's like so vain and so self-obsessed. Right. And um, and Rob is sort of his head, Rob is his head writer, but Rob is like very like, you know, level-headed and like normal compared to like someone like Alan Brady, the star of the show. I love, um, Maury Amsterdam as uh, I think Buddy is his name in the show. And and then um, Rosemary, his two co-writers. Okay. Um, I, I love their like banter when they're in the writer's room. And and then Mel, with, I think it's Richard Deacon. When he comes in, he always, uh, Maury Amsterdam's character always knocks on Mel and makes fun of him for being bald. And I mean, it's just ruthless, like insult comedy, you know, every time. Mel comes in the room. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about it is, well, <laughs> Mary Tyler Moore is just, to me, uh, just as lovely as Elizabeth Mary, Montgomery. Mary Tyler Moore was also easy to look at, I'll admit. And, and such a, she's such a beloved comic actress. Like she's so, she just oozes like sympathy and um, like she does what any great actor should do. Like, you know, Tom Holland from the Spider-Man movies. Yeah. Um, I think that guy's a great actor because when he emotes on screen, I feel like what, he, what he's trying to convey, like, like I, I empathize with him, um, right. because he makes me feel it. Cause he's such a good actor. And I feel the same way about Mary Tyler Moore. She's such a good actress that you just feel whatever she's feeling, you know? Um, and then, of course, Dick Van Dyke is, he was one of the most brilliant physical comedians uh, of his generation, you know? He, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I hear. That's what I always heard about, about him. I, like I said, I, I was never a huge fan, so I don't, I have not seen his genius or his talents. But I, I'll the, take your word for it because I, you know, even I, even though I've never seen the show, I still know about it because of how popular it was when it was out. And also because it was on Nick and Knight as well. It was always see, it was always see it on the, uh, on the, the the TV guide or you know coming up next Dick Van Dyke show you know that kind of deal so right I knew it's a big, I knew it was a big deal um can I share this real quick sure man go ahead oh sorry I guess I have to do it one second I'm well, not as professional well, at sharing things as it's all good Julius. it's all good uh hold on let me let me uh let me remove your screen so that way you can do your thing um I'm going to show this real quick, even though we uh -huh. might get flagged. Uh -huh. This is one of my favorites right here. You know what if this we, is. If we keep the sound off, we should be okay, right? I don't know. I think if I pause it every once in a while and, and talk over it, I think we should be fine. But okay, I let's just talk want over to it, talk yeah. about comedic timing here. Okay. So...
<laughs> is this one of her moments where she tries to get Ricky to cast her in something? <laughs> Just like candy. <laughs> I mean, come on. They don't make them like that no more, man. They don't make them like that. It's just so, it was so subtle. So, it's so good. It, it just, what was that? Like maybe 30 seconds? Yeah. And look how much I was laughing. Just, and I've seen this like a hundred times and still cracks me up because of how, how well done she, she like performs that. Like you mentioned, yeah. you know, about uh, Tom Holland, when you feel, when he emotes and you, oh, and yeah. you feel it. And she has the same the same talent, which is she emotes it. And you're like, you can't help but laugh about how well she she emotes, you know, her <laughs> what she's feeling at the moment. Which is yeah, this, that's the episode where she's trying to get cast in one of uh, a get a commercial. You know who's uh, also like that for me? I know that's kind of like a um, that's a weird parameter to put on an actor like this. These like an actor like Tom Holland or Mary Tyler Moore just makes me feel what they're feeling. But uh, John Candy always made me feel like that. John like, Candy, yeah, he was a good one. I always felt when John Candy was acting on screen, like I I felt like I understood exactly his emotions, you know. Um let's see, I wonder what was really in the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was something terrible and they just they didn't tell her and she couldn't cut it, or I don't know, or that or that ID crisis, or maybe she was just freaking talent. That's how talented she was. She knew exactly what to do during yeah. that, that scene. So you ready? You ready, Sean? To do this? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Screen? I just want to show the intro to the Dick Van Dyke show, which is, and I'll keep the sound off, but um, no, play you know, it. Screw it. Play it. No. Okay. If it goes down, it goes down. You know who cares? Here he is. <laughs> oh yes, the famous. Uh, I remember. I know that intro. <laughs> and Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> um. Rewind that. Rewind that. Rewind that sure. real quick. Yeah. Uh, I just I love the sound effect. <laughs> he falls over. I've always been, yeah. <laughs> I love that. The little piano sound that I always love that that comedic sound whenever anyone fall like will fall down during that time, that era. He he, he would if he had been born in the silent movie era, he would have been a silent movie actor. He would have been. Oh, yeah. a, he would have been a silent movie comedian. He's such a physical comedian. He's a great dancer actually too. Um, really. Yeah, yeah, uh, man, yeah. Man, He's no, a very good dancer. dancer. Very good dancer. You see him. You see a little of that of that in him. Oh, in, and in ID Crisis actually mentioned that as well. Yeah, Mary Poppins. Yeah, when he dances with the penguins. Yeah, he's a great, That's great right. performer. Even at age ninety something, he made a cameo in Mary Poppins Returns, and he jumped up on a desk and danced, and you know, it's just wow. He's, he's an impressive performer. 90 years old at 90 years old. He was not, he's 91 or two when he did the cameo. Yeah. Well, but, did he already um, pass away? No, no, he's still with us. Oh, he's still, okay. I think so. Yeah. I think he's still with us. Okay. But, um, and then I want to mention this other show I watched before we moved to the seventies or eighties. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. F troop. Do you ever watch F troop? F troop. Never heard of it. I've never okay. Heard of F -troop. It came on Nick at night. Also. F troop. Um, you know, what's funny about F troop. In my neighborhood, growing up, there was a local gang called F Troop. Really? Believe it or not, yeah, it's uh, it was it was in the uh, like in the southeast side of the city, and um, <laughs> and yeah, if you claimed any other gang other than F Troop in that area, you were you were doomed. So F Troop was definitely a, a, a gang. I don't know why. I don't know if they got it from the show. I don't know how they got the name, but. There is a, a, a gang in my old neighborhood that's called F Troop. So maybe, yeah. maybe it was part of the show because I know they were they, they were created back in the '60s. So maybe, okay, maybe they did. I'm not maybe. sure. Yeah, because uh, I what, what is the show? I'm, I'm curious. Now I'm curious to know what F Troop was all about. Okay, so, so F Troop. It's so weird for me to say that. <laughs> it was a um, it was a show about a guy who's like a captain in the. Uh, United States um, cavalry and or excuse me cavalry <laughs> um, and he um, he was stationed at, to command this outpost it was like the far western outpost right 
in like the late 1800s post civil war. And, uh, but, but the guy's an idiot and like, he's and then he's an inept commander and all the comedy is derived from the fact that all the, basically the, the union soldiers, they're all kind of just dumb. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> like they're not very, you know, they're not tough. They're not tough frontiersmen. They're not, they're just kind of like dumb, inept, but funny and lovable. And um, there's a group, there's an Indian tribe that lives outside the, um, the gates of the, the, what do you call it? The fort. Um, okay. And the, but the Indians are like very like, <laughs> they're like really good businessmen. And they're always like, um, like, setting up new businesses and like kind of taking advantage of the white people. <laughs> um, but uh, it was, uh, it was just a fun show when I was a kid. I, 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 for some reason, like was drawn to it. So. Uh, why? I'm curious to know why. Um, what was the, the, appeal? it was just silly. It was absurd it was and silly. silly. It was kind of like a Mikhail's Navy or like um, Hogan's heroes. Like, where you just kind of had like, you know, in Hogan's heroes, they're like all these POWs and the, the Nazis run the, the, the POW camp, but like, but it's such a ridiculous premise because the Nazis are, or the Germans are like nice to them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I like, see. and the Germans are like, they're so nice to them that they're like worried that they won't like them, you know? Um, and it's, I guess it's taking a very serious situation, like a military situation, and just turning it into a farce, basically. I see. Okay. Yeah. But. Uh, before we move on, I actually did come up. I have another show that I used to love as a kid. Um, you might be a little surprised. Maybe not. Maybe not. Considering that you know, you know, you've known me a few, a few years now, and maybe this will make sense to you uh, once I show it here. Oh, love the show. Get smart. Yeah. Great show. Get smart. This Would is another you... <laughs> show I love from the 60s. Uh, yeah. I loved it. Uh, I love this character. And I was so happy to find out that he was the voice of Inspector Gadget because that was one of my favorite cartoons as a yeah. kid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact that he was the voice of, of, of Inspector Gadget was like, that. it just, it makes sense. To me, it was like, that, it makes sense. Yeah. Because this guy, Kind of play like a buffoon in the show, uh, kind of like a, you know, luck was always on his side type of deal. I, I love that. I yeah, know, like I love a, that. Like a yeah, pink panther kind of. Yeah, yeah. Kind of where he yeah. like every, he's at the right place, at the right time every time, even though he's like <laughs> he's not the smartest, you know, knife in the tool in the in the kitchen, right? So that's the same right. goes. Did you yeah, see the but movie? I, I love that. Steve Carell. I did not want to watch the movie. Didn't want to. You watch know, it. you know, it's not bad, Julio. It's not bad. It's it's, it's not it's like I don't know. It's pretty good. Know. Like like they could have done a lot worse adapting this. And Steve Crow was, I think, the perfect person to to reprise this role or to I guess reboot this role. I you know, Steve Carell is one of those actors that I just he over uh kind of like over overstayed his welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In terms of like act like his uh yeah, I, I agree with you, Happy Jam Jam. No remake. I, I I just don't like remakes or, you know, leave the show the way it is. Like, it, it was fine the way it was. Let's keep it as an archive. Let's watch the reruns. You know, enjoy it for what it was. Mm. But if you're no, telling me it's good, I, I might I might watch it as a, a, you know, one day if I have nothing to watch, uh, I might watch that. That's, you know what, next time you, like, find yourself at home with a cold for two days, that that's a movie you can watch. It's one of those, like, sick day movies. Uh, how's it going ryan nice yeah. to have you with us um but yeah it was a great show night agent 99 too was great he, i never seen that one no 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 she was agent 99 was his like oh, oh, oh i think it was a show <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen she was show. the female spy who that's was that's right like, though who was a competent the competent who was spy. competent yeah yes yeah. yes uh yeah this is great stuff this is a this is one of my favorites uh as well up there um for those of you joining us we're talking about sitcom, our favorite sitcom so if you have favorite sitcoms from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, please share in the in the uh, in the comment section, and I'll uh, well, we can either talk about it or we can agree or disagree. It doesn't really matter. So uh, if you do have some of your favorites, don't be shy to uh, post them. 
So, okay, I think that covers the 60s because I can't think of any other show. I mean, there's Gilligan's Island. There's all these other shows, but I was never a big fan of Gilligan's Island. I, I thought it was a stupid show, personally. I think we covered the highlights for me, personally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because the other shows are kind of like, okay, like Bonanza and Beverly Hillbillies. Or, they're kind of like, eh. You know, they're... The only yeah. thing I liked about Beverly Hillbillies was the song. The theme song was my favorite. <laughs> That's the only thing I liked you know, about it. <laughs> the one thing I'll say about that show is my grandpa thought Granny was funny. I remember that, you know, Granny in Beverly yeah, yeah. Hills, like, yeah. the old lady. <laughs> she was, she was pretty. Yeah, she was pretty funny. Uh, who? Yeah. Another show. Uh, there was another show. Um, gosh, I, I can't think of it right now. Oh, uh, Monsters. Monsters was pretty good. But, I liked the Monsters. Yeah, yeah, but it was like, hey, you know, it, it like uh, once again, it overstayed its welcome. It was like you couldn't go so far with this kind of show. And the same thing with the Adams Family. You couldn't go so far with that kind of show. But yeah, the Get Smart, um, uh, the Andy Griffith Show, and what was the third one that I chose? Those were the ones that were that were really uh, uh, bewitched. Those are the ones that that I really like. I really uh, enjoyed mm -hmm. as a kid. Yeah, it's good connect. stuff. So, yeah, very good um, stuff. So, I don't know that I have a lot for the seventies. Do you have any for the seventies, Julian? I do. I do. All right. Um, Lay them on me. Here we go. Here's my first one. Okay. Oh look, you have a you have a pro uh, a buddy, yeah. Dick Van Dyke, another Dick Van Dyke fan. Alf, <laughs> we'll get Alf. to Alf we'll, in the eighties. We'll get to Alf. <laughs> and, oh, Batman! Oh, we're gonna talk about Batman. Sure. Uh, Batman was oh. fun, but but again, you know, overstate its welcome. It was how much how much do you, can you get with the the pow and the zam and the zooms and stuff? It's it got annoying for me after a while. You it's know what I love in Batman is the shot they always did where they were climbing. They were clearly yeah. like <laughs> just turning the camera sideways. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I always enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, and it always had different cameos, which was cool. And great, great villains in Batman. Um, you know, Cesar Romero and Eartha Kitts and a lot of great performances for like the 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 villains of Batman. Here we go. Oh, yeah, 70s, me. buddy. Lay it on me, man. Uh -huh, I thought you were gonna say this. Yeah, you got. I got to. It, it's talk about hey, pushing head. the envelope. Talking about talk about you know taking it there and being bold and going. You know what? America's ready for a realist character. America's ready for the racist, the lovable racist. <laughs> Hey, at some point, Ryan, at some point, you know, you're going to get, you're going to take so much of something before you're like, oh, okay, dude, it's, it's old. Like, you know, try something else. Just do something else. So, uh, yeah, I'm very picky, Ryan. Very picky. But yeah, All in the Family for me was, whoops, was, I, um, go ahead, go ahead. No, I watched this show a little bit and I, I have a good, I have an appreciation for what the formula was and everything. And of course I remember Meathead, right. And his. He was right. constantly in that arm armchair, just spouting his opinion about everything. But what did you like about this show? <laughs> um, it reminded me of my stepdad. Okay. Because my stepdad was the guy in the chair giving his opinion about everything. <laughs> uh, and maybe maybe not as maybe not as uh, as harsh. Right. Uh, my stepdad was harsher because okay. you know Archie Bunker was constricted by television, right? Right. He can't really say everything. But my stepdad right. could say everything because he wasn't on a, on a TV sitcom. So right. I, that's, what I, that's what I meant by harsher. Um, so Archie Bunker is, um, is it, it, he just, like I say, he reminded me of my stepdad a lot because of how he just is straight out, not afraid to say it. He's not afraid to to say what he thinks. And, you know, if, if you have a problem with that, hey, that's your fault, not mine, because you can't take what I'm telling you. Yeah, and that's what in a nutshell. That's what my my stepdad was. He was that kind of guy. That he's the one that 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 pretty much molded me to who I am today. Which was, uh, I have the same uh, uh, approach. Which is, if I tell you something that's true and you get offended by it or mad, then that's that's not my fault. That's your fault, because what I'm telling you is true. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm just telling you what's what's true, right? So. So does Julius, I hear Julius's wife in the background. Does he have an armchair from which he spouts these things? Uh, uh -huh. Sean wants to know if I have an armchair where I spouse all my, 
all my uh, opinions. No, you can espouse your opinions from wherever you are. Very okay. easily. <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay. gosh! Uh, yeah, yeah. This was a trailblazer. Happy Jam Jam. No, Julius would overstay. We must chain these actors to the roles, even reel out their dead bodies to puppet their roles. <laughs> and Ryan Ryan, uh, haha, that was my stepdad too. I think that was all our stepdad, Ryan. It was that generation. It was if that, that old generation. You know, if I'd had a stepdad, I'm sure he would have been like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so. Um, yeah, this was definitely this hit really, really like at home for me um, because I, not only was it funny for me, um, I also liked the fact that you had the son-in-law played by Rob Reiner, who was the and the antithesis. He was the the um, the different perspective, the liberal perspective that always clashed with his with Archie Bunker's. Uh, I don't want to say conservative, but you know the hard. Traditionalism. Traditional, yeah, yeah. Where well, the one yeah. was like hard work, shut up, don't complain, <laughs> you know, man right. up, and and you got and just do what you got to do. Right. And of course, right. Rob Reiner's character was like, no, because what about this? What about this? And you know, and so on and so forth. So it was great. It made for great comedy, first of its kind. Um, I think yeah. this is definitely for me. Cool. Um, uh, what modern America? It, it was. It, it was in other words, TV caught up with modern America during when this show came out in this, you know in the 70s and there's certainly a prototype here like i can't speak to a lot of what this show i don't have a lot of opinions about this show in particular but i see a prototype there for characters like um and relationships between characters like um alex in um family ties right who's this conservative what? reagan yeah. republican and his parents are like these hippie liberals um you know, kind of from the sixties and he's from the eighties. Um, it reminds me of the sort of the Leslie Nope, Ron Swanson relationship where their politics are just so different, you know? Um, and then Jack Donaghy, Liz Lemon is another great example of that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that show was a trailblazer in that way. Yeah. Uh, so you, you don't have any other shows at all because I have a few. Um, you know, I, I always loved, um, I always Different loved one. One. I always loved the Mary Tyler Moore show, which um, came out after the Dick Van Dyke show. I think that went into the 70s. And as I mentioned before, I really love her as a performer. Um, Ed Asner was really great in that show. And then um, I used to watch the Rhoda, which was like a spinoff of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Oh, and I used to watch Laverne and Shirley. Oh, the Runner Shirley. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. yeah, yeah. yeah okay. with Lenny and Squiggy. Lenny and I love <laughs> Lenny and Squiggy so much. Uh, yeah, that yeah. was that was actually that was a good one. That was a gem for me too. Um, yeah, uh, uh, what's her name? Penny Marshall was was definitely channeling a little bit of Lucille Ball, but she she had her own obviously her own truth spot, I guess that she she um, presented on that show, and it was it was a uh, I, I loved it. Yeah, it was one of my favorites too. Uh, growing up as well, very hilarious. This show, although is revered even to this day, uh, I hated it because it was for me. It was like okay, it's time for for me to go to sleep now. And the show that I'm talking about is Mash. Uh. <laughs> yeah, once I heard that theme song, and it's on the helicopter, that shot the aerial shot, the helicopter. I was like, okay, it's time to go to bed. It's too late. Turn off the TV. <laughs> yeah. <to> go to bed. <laughs> did you ever see? Did you ever see the um, Futurama where they made fun of Mash? And there was like no, a ro no. there was like a robot that was like Hawkeye, and he had like Alan Alda's voice, and he was like he had two settings. One was glib, and one was maudlin. So like he'd be like joking around and going ha ha ha, and then they'd flip it to maudlin, and he'd be like. Life is nothing but death. Like it's just like turns on a dime. <laughs> no, maybe no, I, I can find that clip real quick. It's pretty great. Yeah, try to find it. There's another show that I I want to uh, that I really like from the seventies that I thought um, I still think to this day is very underrated. I don't think a lot of people uh, talk about it too much, even though it's it's really really good. Um, 
And mainly because once again, it was one of those things where I connected to it because it was it was uh, closer to home. Give me a second here. Let me just uh, find it. Oh, here it is. I found it. And let me show mine first. Uh, there. Sanford and Son. Oh, I used to love that show. Yeah, Sanford and Son. Great show. Uh, underrated, I think. Uh, I still believe it's underrated. And what did he not, call many, not many people talk about it. But this show was fantastic. I loved the show. I loved the premise. I loved the setting. And like I said, it felt close to home. It felt this, this show felt close to home for me growing up. I feel like Julius. I feel like this could be a two parter because I mean we're I only so. we're only in the seventies, so. you know. Yeah, I think I think you're right. We're already eight o'clock. We're already uh, cl we're close to an hour. It's been, it's been forty five minutes. Yeah. All right. Let me we'll, uh, let me. We'll, 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 if it if it does end up going a little too long, we'll we'll split it. Okay. We'll we'll keep talking because yeah, there's a lot, especially the eighties because the eighties was the the boom period for us, you know, because that was the, that was when we were we were born. And we're a little old enough to start watching TV. And then there's a bunch of stuff on TV at that time anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Don't say Chico and the Man. <laughs> now, you know, I never, ID Crisis, I never seen that show. I've heard of it, Freddie Prince Sr. Um, but I just never, I never, uh, I guess I never got into it. Even though from what I, I read and seen, Freddie Prince was a, was a very funny man. Uh, but I have yet to, to see any of the, um, his uh, I used to the, the LS theme from my. Oh, you do. That's right, Ryan. You do, Ryan. Uh, uh, Sean, for if you don't know, Ryan Wynn has his own YouTube channel. It's a great channel. It's a uh, he he uh, he interviews other creators, a combo creators, and he um inks and draws during his live streams while he he's talking to the other cool. creators, and he does have the Laverne Shirley theme for his oh. intro his video. <laughs> We're gonna make it after all. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great. All right. So you ready to show yours? I got this. Let's yeah. See. Okay. Here we go. I don't. I so I don't remember like everything about this clip, but this is the joke I was talking about. Some for the enemy to kill. Leave Doctor Zoidberg alone. He has twice the training you do. Yeah, he's a doctor and a butcher. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it starts. First with the jokes, then comes the heavy stuff. <laughs> When will the killing end? <laughs> I'm afraid he's gone. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> like, yeah, that's Hawkeye. So. Okay, well. Um, you still want to go 70s? Or you, now you want to move on to the, to the 80s since you don't have that many 70s shows that you, per, that you personally liked? I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think we're good to move on to the 80s. Yeah, because... Okay. Um, I just want to make one remark though about Sanford and Son. One of the great, and I know, I know Julius um, is not. I don't think Julius has watched Thirty Rock, right? Right, Julius, you no, haven't watched that show. I have not seen it now. And for me, it's just like my favorite show ever. And there's this great joke in Thirty Rock where Jack, Alec Baldwin's character, and Tracy Morgan's character, Tracy Jordan, are having a feud, and tracy to get back at jack <laughs> jack goes to the symphony right and the the direct or the conductor of the symphony goes i have good news someone has endowed our symphony with a 10 million dollar gift and jack's like oh that's nice and then he says so in tribute to our anonymous donor instead of our regular programming tonight of beethoven and bach and whatever <laughs> Here is a four-hour rendition of the theme song from Sanford and Son. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, you know, the or he he conducts the orchestra and it goes, dun dun da 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 For four hours. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> it's one of the best moments in 30 Rock. It's amazing. But, um, yeah, 80s. So, um, first one that comes to my mind is family ties right alex p ties, michael yeah. j fox you know oddly enough that was not um that was not one of my favorites oddly enough okay it was i don't know i don't know what it was it, it, it's not that i didn't like the show it, i i don't know why i would try to watch it and i just couldn't watch it and i think it's because i was so into back to the future at the time 
I just couldn't bring myself to watch Marty act normal. <laughs> so that's why I was. That's why I I, I couldn't do it because I you know, I was so enamored with Marty McFly, the character, that when I saw um, Michael J. Fox on a TV role acting normal, it was like I couldn't I, I couldn't bring myself okay. to enjoy it. I think that's what it was. But maybe if I watch it now. As a, as an adult, I might I might appreciate it more. You know, speaking of physical performers, um, Michael J. Fox is a brilliant physical comedian oh, yeah. performer, and that's yeah, the absolutely. thing. He and he's great in Family Ties. He's I think he's hilarious. It's a really great part, really great, well written part for him. But you're right; he doesn't have those opportunities in Family Ties to be to be as physical or really right. to be physical like he is in Back to the Future. You know, the stuff he does in Back to the Future where he's like sliding across the hood or he's like doing right. the, the guitar yeah. riffs on his back legs, you know, like um, he's I think that's that's something that doesn't get talked about a lot about back why Back to the Future is such a classic film and why it's so beloved is is Michael J. Fox is just like kinetic physical performance. It's yeah. it, it's really incredible. And I think that's why when um, when the Spider-Man movie came out and people are saying, oh, Tom Holland, if you recast <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Um, <laughs> if, if you recast uh, the Back to the Future movies today, people, you know, I remember when the Spider-Man movie came out, people saying, oh, Tom Holland would have made a great Marty McFly, you know, and. I think the reason for that is because he's a very good actor, but he's he's funny, he's likable, and he's very physical, just like Michael J. Yeah. Fox was. Like Michael J. Fox, yeah. yeah. I hope they never let, let's just let's just uh, throw poison at that idea. Okay. Let's throw poison at that idea. No, do not remake. That doesn't mean we want Back to Future remade and with Tom Holland. Please don't do that. Just leave it alone. I I know no Hollywood. Leave it I, alone. Bad. Bad Hollywood. Bad. I probably mentioned this on the BTTF episode we did, but I I feel compelled to say it again. So Robert Zemeckis was asked once if he would ever allow Back to the Future to be rebooted or something like that. And, he, and his exact words were over my dead body and over Bob Gale's, basically over him and got Bob Gale's dead bodies, right? So I think and they're going to wait until they die. I think that's what's going to happen. That's, that may be true, but, but, <laughs> but he also said, he said, you don't remake ID crisis. We're getting there, man. We're getting there. Um, <laughs> Zemeckis said, you don't remake citizen Kane. And right. as baller of a thing as that is to say, he's absolutely right. The back to future is the citizen Kane of popcorn movies, but oh, yeah. we're doing, a, we're doing a sitcom show. So I'll stop. Yeah. Right. That. No, but there's just to put out, just to put it out there in the ether, right? Just put it out there. Do not remake back to the future. Yes. It's fine the way it is. You could watch it 20 years from now and it's still going to be great. And George awesome. Lucas, don't do a special edition of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I've always wanted, you know, more flying cars flying in the background. Yeah. You know, entered, you know, Hill Valley. <laughs> when I first made Back to the Future, I couldn't put as many flying cars as I wanted. <laughs> and that's why the movie was not as good as it should have been. <laughs> All right. So let's segue to the 80s. 80s sitcom. Now I put the, a couple of comments on the screen. And of course, the big ones, it's, it's the elephant in the room. We have to uh, put it out there because I was a fan of it. I don't know if you were a fan of it. Oh, I loved it. I, My family I was a loved huge, it. I was a huge Bill Cosby fan. Like, I loved the show. It was a great show. It was funny. Um, it was it was uh, very not only funny but it, uh, sometimes it, it dealt with some certain like heavy subjects and that's what I liked about it. That sometimes sometimes it went there, not all the time, but for the most part it was funny, hilarious. Great. I mean, it was all based on Bill Cosby's comedy about his kids and about his yeah. family, and and it all came through. Um, you know, the his relationship with Theo or Rudy or right. Vanessa yeah. or like, and and all those kids too are cast so so well um yeah so let's uh let's end it there because uh i don't want to give this man too much praise. okay all right um, all so right we'll just we'll just put it out there that hey the show was good we recognize we enjoyed it we recognize it but 
And we recognize the hundreds. <laughs> and we recognize the hundreds of people who worked on that show that were not yes. named Bill Cosby, because right, right, um, the writers, the directors, the actors involved, um, who who also played a, a big role in making sure the show was successful. Not not only, um, uh, you know, Bill Cosby, even though he was obviously. Uh, What's it say? Uh, hey, hey, Bill Cosby. That's what I call it in writing when the writer hides things inside his writings for the audience to drink. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that, Happy Jam Jam. The old man have four of all Cosby vinyls and unpleasantness has turned those uh. into separating art from the artist ninjas. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's a shame. Um, obviously, people, everyone knows what happened. There's no need to repeat it here, but uh, it's just a shame that it happened, that he did what he did uh, because... Um, you know, his show was good. His show was great. It's just a shame he couldn't live by it uh, in real life. Yeah. But, I feel like we could do a whole show on Bill Cosby's moral failings, but yeah, we should probably. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at this. Well it says here, uh, at Ryan went, ha, yeah, you see the twinkle in Sean's eyes when they mentioned the remake. No. You know, something tells me, Sean, that perhaps if the Gale, the Bobs, were to pass away, and they came knocking on your door and said, hey, Sean, would you be interested in being a cinematographer for the remake of Back to the Future? Okay, yeah, I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course you would. I mean, how could you not? I mean. <laughs> oh, how quickly the tables turn when it's your chance to shine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you have it, folks. I helped you get the cat out of the bag. Sean will do the remake if he was. Yeah. <laughs> if, there's if, enough... he was, if he was offered the, the, part, uh, the, the chance to be the cinematographer for the <laughs> Back to the Future remake. That's right. Yeah. If it was, uh, in other words, for the right amount of money and uh, fame. Yeah, I would do it. No, just kidding. All right. Let's move on to the 80s then. That's okay. Cosby's out of the way. Let's Let's talk about what else. Uh, go ahead, Sean. You let's let's do instead of two, let's do three, maybe four, because there's a lot. There's a lot here to unpack. So, um, um well, we got to talk about if we're talking about the '80s. You got to talk about TGIF, right? Thank goodness it's Friday, and of course, this kind of bleeds into the early '90s too. But that era of sitcoms where we we're watching shows like Full House, um, Perfect Strangers. Um, that was kind of in the early days of TGIF. Um, I loved, I loved all those shows. I loved perfect strangers. And then I loved step-by-step Step. for some reason, when that show came out, I thought that Step-by-step. Step, when I was a kid, I, I love that show. Um, and then, um, family matters, right. With Urkel. <laughs> family matters. You can't go wrong with family. Yeah. Matters. Did I, did I do that? Yeah. 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 You can't go wrong with that. Uh, Cheers. Cheers, surprisingly, was one of my favorites as well. I'm so glad you mentioned Cheers. Um, I came to like – Cheers wasn't one I watched as a young person, but I came to like it as an older person when I went back yeah, and watched the show. And it is a really brilliantly written, funny show about a bunch of losers who go to a bar every day for like 10 years straight. And uh, it's great. It's wonderful. And, and, and Cheers introduced the world to Kelsey Grammer. And Kelsey Grammer and is one of my and, and Christy Alley too. Don't forget. About oh, and Christy Alley. Alley, of course. Um, I mean, Ted Danson's one of my favorite actors. Kelsey Grammer is one of my favorite actors. Um, Woody Harrelson's one of my favorite actors. Like, yeah, just a great, great show. Ah, Wild About Eighty Eight, Family Ties. We you just missed it, man. We we already discussed it. We we discussed it. We're we're moving on to Cheers. <laughs> um, but yeah, a great, wonderful show. Brown yeah, it is. It, it was. Uh, I like that. It was. Um, yeah, you're right. Blue collar, very blue collar. Once again, you know, I I came from that world, so I was able to connect with the show because it, it felt like hey, I can. I feel like I could. I could get along with these people, like if I was old enough and hang out at this bar, where all sorts of drama and, and craziness occurred. And uh, who's the other actress other than Christy Alley? That was. She was really good. She was in the first season. I, for, I keep forgetting her oh, name. Um, Face is that... recognizable. Diane Chambers. Um, Diane Chambers. What was she's her? another one that was the, really good. Yeah, uh, the character's name is Diane Chambers. Yeah, she doesn't get enough love. Um, here we go. 
There she yeah. is. Shelly Long. Shelly Long. Shelly Long. Um, yeah. Oh, no, she was a great foil to Ted Danson's yeah, character. And I want to put a shout out for Sam Malone. Huh? Sam Malone, Sean Malone. <laughs> my, you, you know, a sitcom character who's, you know, made my name famous. <laughs> coach, I love this guy uh, uh, that plays Eddie Pantuso. Coach, um, he actually uh, the older gentleman there, the tie. Oh, this he, guy, this guy here? Okay. Yeah, he um, he was a great, really funny part of the show. He actually passed away uh, several years into the run, and then um, he was replaced by Woody Harrelson. Um, oh, I see. Okay, I didn't know that. But yeah. Again, the sitcom, you know, we talk about what a sitcom is and it's like, oh, what if we took an ex-ball player who's also an alcoholic, but he hasn't had a drink in 12 years and he owns a bar? Like, <laughs> you know, what, what can we make out of that, right? Uh, yeah, and it worked. It's a formula that still works to this day. I mean, that's what situation, that's, I mean, if you look at the, at the root word of sitcom, you find out it's, it's situational comedy. So that's what good comedy is. It's situational. It's something that you put two opposites in the same room and that can always lead to comedy always. And that that's, it's a formula that's tried and true. It doesn't, it never fails. It's just a matter of who's involved that either makes it or breaks it. So sometimes you do get it. Like for instance, cheers is a, is a prime example of getting the right actors um, to play the, the, the right parts and everything comes together beautifully. With the with you know because they they could perform what the writers you know sit down and um and and give to the actors to to uh, portray the, the character so it's uh it, Cheers was definitely a show that definitely um got uh, uh everything was right for that to to happen and yeah. and it was huge it was a huge show too I remember as a kid that's all I heard about was Cheers like it was like one of those shows that everyone just talked about because. And everyone was sad to see it go when it did go, uh, but it was just time, you know, just like everything else. That's why I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of not stretching things out too thin. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a person who likes to end things when they're done. That's why I respect Ricky Gervais because, you know, he could have definitely cashed in on the office for as long as he wanted, but he he decided to end it because he didn't want to be that guy for ten years. And kudos for him. For, for doing that, for sticking to his guns and going, you know what? I'm going to do only two, three seasons of this and I'm done. I'm out and I'm going to do something else. And but that's, he, got I like that. have, he got to have his cake and eat it too, because then he got to be the creator of the American office. And then yeah, that yeah, for like that was nine it. Years. And he could just, he could just sit back and be like, right, I'm good. I could do yeah. whatever I want now. And uh, of course, uh, uh, extras was great. I loved extras. Um, and I, I was happy that it was it only lasted, I think three, two seasons. I can't remember two or three seasons. I can't. I don't remember which of the, of the two, but hmm. um, yeah. And then he just keeps on making more and more stuff. And I, and I like that. I'm a big fan of that. Um, another show that I, I also like, well, you, you mentioned, uh, what was the show you, the first show you mentioned, uh, Sean, that you liked from the eighties? Oh, I, I, brought, I, I about, brought cheers. I brought cheers in, but yeah, I, I, I think this is more early nineties, but I, I was just talking about TGIF watching that as a kid and watching right. like, Full House and Step by Step and um, Family Matters and shows like that. But um, Cheers, Cheers is like let's let's face it, Cheers. Go ahead, is, come here, say it. My wife wants to uh, uh, get some of her list. Too. Go ahead, talk. I like you, Small Wonder. Oh, Small Wonder. <laughs> sure. I like Small Wonder. That was my. That was like one of my favorites. I, so small. I want it to be Vicky. No, no, no. So bad. No, no. I liked that show too. Um, that when was, I was my a, favorite show too, believe it or not. I, when was I was a little show. kid. Yeah. I think I had a crush on Small Wonder. I'm not, if I'm remembering. Who didn't, Sean? Yeah. Who didn't have a crush on Small <laughs> Wonder? I mean, I know she's a robot, but. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Small <laughs> Wonder. Yeah, it was great. I love the, sick, uh, the sitcom. I love the, uh, um, the theme song of the show. That was a great show. Okay. Uh, a great, a great theme song. Uh, but yeah, step by step, family matters. So TGIF was your sub hub of like shows you had to watch every Friday. Yeah, Friday and it was something my family watched together. You know, I remember watching it with my brother and sister, especially. 
and my and my parents too would watch it with us. Um, it was family friendly, you know. Well, of course, yeah. TGI. Yeah. Uh, what can you go wrong with that? Um, any other shows? In the 90s well, that you could think of I'm other, just, outside outside of TGIF that you may. I think we should. Because Cheers is going to segue me into Frasier, right? Yeah, but the Frasier was 90s, wasn't it? That was 90s, yeah. Yeah, we're, and not, then there I, we're not there yet. We're not quite there yet, but I feel like it deserves to be mentioned with the Cheers situation. But um, no, I think Cheers was a great mention. But yeah, we can move on. And I am thinking a part two, Julius. I think we should split this. Should we end in the 90s or should we end in the... Uh... Uh, 80s. Well, what do you, what's your call here? Because we're already over in the hour mark. Uh, I don't know if you want to keep going. Mm-hmm. We don't have to keep going if you don't want to. We could we could split this, but we'll have uh, James with us, and we will have to push back the underrated and overrated directors volume two to a, a later show. Yeah. But then, but let's uh, you know don't remember don't forget that you're going to be shooting the movie soon, so you'll be gone for a few weeks. That's right. So. I think next week, um, a crossover that we all wish we could get happy jam jam. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Terminator versus small. <laughs> well, it's up to you, but, uh, we could, we could keep going, push to the nineties and then we can end it after the nineties. And then we'll maybe later on after you come back from your shoot, and then we get situated again. We'll do it again. Uh, but nineties, uh, nineties, uh, uh, or maybe not entire nineties, be mid nineties. Because there's a nineties was like the explosion of shows, like right. just a massive amount of shows in the nineties. It was just like a, a tremendous amount of shows that came out in the nineties that were that were really good. Eighties was still it was growing, but nineties was just a like an explosion. Okay, yeah, let's um. I think we should. I think we should pause it here, and then I think we should do this part two when I'm back from from my trip. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, let's to continue on the '80s. I um. Uh, damn, Sean. Well, Sean's not going away. He's shooting the movie. He's shooting a full length feature, ladies and gentlemen. Next month. Next month. Which is uh, like he is a doing. Few days away. He is a. Uh, he's going to be the cinematographer of a of a indie, independent uh, film. And um, he's going to go for it, man. This is what it's all about. This is what cinema is all about. He's going to go for it, pursue his dreams. And pretty soon we'll have uh, more news about this this uh, independent film. And um, we'll give you guys updates as we get them. And we'll let you guys know when there's um, – if it will be showing in a, in a film festival near you. Hopefully, God willing, if, if uh, this COVID situation does die down, hopefully it does. And if it does, then we'll definitely have a chance to watch his film in the in a theater, which will be awesome. Like yeah, that's the that's where it needs to be shown. It needs to be shown inside a theater, and presented the way it's supposed to be presented. So we'll definitely keep you guys p- uh, posted on that. And um, yeah, so when that when more news comes in, we'll give you more information, and you guys can check it out. But right now, it's still under wraps. Right now, it's hush hush. You know, we don't. It's best to always not talk too much about your project. It's always best to just kind of give little tidbits here and there. And then when it's ready, once it's ready and complete, then you could, you know, yeah. announce it and, and let everyone know. Yeah. Uh, Ryan says, break a lens. <laughs> That's good, Ryan. I like that. Break a lens. And uh, happy Jam Jams is wishing you well. Oh, on your, thank you. On your uh, work. And it's thank you, Ryan. Great. Thank you. Happy Jam Jam. Sean, Sean is a very, uh, not only is he a talented and skilled cinematographer, he, he has a, a encyclopedic knowledge of how to light a scene so i have no doubt that um that it's going to be great you know i think you're gonna light a great movie thanks buddy thank now. you so um continue on with our 80s okay. this show i used to hate as a kid i used to hate it it annoyed the crap out of me because i never understood why anyone would like this show but now that i'm a little older and I started watching it with my wife because my wife is a huge fan of the show. I was, and I found it, I found it to be extremely funny, surprisingly funny, by the way. And the show that I'm talking about is 
Golden Girls. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I never would have thought I would see the day where I would say that I'm a fan of Golden Girls because as I, as I was telling you as a kid, I used to hate this damn show because I didn't understand it. Why do people want to watch a show about four single old ladies? What is the point of this show? Why? Why would anyone want to watch this? What's the point? But now that I'm older, I get it. <laughs> I, I understand now why. Why? It's so good. It's so well written. It's funny. All the all the actresses on the show are fantastic. Uh, the writing is great. And now I understood why it was, you know, why the show was what it was. Betty, you know, Betty, uh, gosh, Betty, what's her name? Betty, Betty, Betty White. White. Betty White. White. Yeah. Uh, the, the actress in the middle, I don't know who she, I don't know her name. But um, um, <laughs> I'm not all about that old. <laughs> Wait, what did Ryan she, say? Yeah, she. Uh, he said, uh, "Now Julia's all about that old." <laughs> so Beatrice Arthur is the woman you're referring to. Okay, she was freaking fantastic. Yeah, she's a great actress, and I, and I and I was surprised I never heard of her, but apparently she was a famous TV actress, theater act. She was more. Of, famous for her theater work, which is not surprising because typically uh, people who succeed more in, in TV are typically come from the theater background because they're in front of an audience. They know how to work with the audience. They, it's like, it's easy for them to, to adapt to the television. So um, yeah, this show was seriously surprising me. Like how I was surprised how good it was when I started watching it with my wife. Do you know how old Betty White is? No. How old is she? She's 99 years old. 99 years old. She's 99 years old. I just looked it up. Yeah. And so here, here she looks like she's she's almost 70, <laughs> to be honest with you. Well, she probably was. So, I mean, that was 40 years ago. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> she's been old a long time. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah. Gosh, I don't man, remember yeah. much about this show. I wasn't, um, it wasn't one of my... I didn't watch it a lot, but um, okay, yeah, no, same, same here. I just, like I said, I started yeah. recently watching it with my wife. So, but now, I, the reason why I, I bring it up because now I understand why it was such a big deal in the eighties, right? And why it was still being shown the reruns when I was a kid because yeah. it, was, it really was great. It really was a great show. Um, so this is one show I, I think it's definitely up there as one of the greats. Um, up there with maybe not as high as Lucy Honeymooners, you know, All in the Family, but it's it's there. It's it has it's strong. So yeah, that one that show was another show that, that I wanted to share with you guys. It's one of the great 80s sitcoms that I, I now um uh appreciate. Another show too that kind of came later in the 80s, late 80s, I want to say, but it really hit a stride in the 90s. But I'm still gonna mention it because it started in the 80s, late 80s. And well, there's two more before we, we call it quits because I okay. gotta mention the, the, last, the second to last one. Okay. Because um, it's important. It's, it's a staple in my childhood. And I think it's a staple for all the people's childhoods who's on the stream, who's in the comment section. Um, but yeah, hold on. Let me, let me bring it up here. The first one, you may not like it, Sean, because maybe it's not, it wasn't your, your part, your, I guess it wasn't your cup of tea. But I'm sure you know what show I'm gonna I'm talking about, and the show I'm talking about is Married with Children. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Married with Children, like I said, the show found its stride in the '90s. It was huge in the '90s. Yeah. But I wanted to bring it up today because it started in the '80s and we're still in the '80s. So in the in part two of the sitcom series, we'll talk more about this show. But I just wanted to mention it as like a. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, what do you call those? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase for it. Honorable mention. Okay. In the 80s. Okay. All right. Married with children. Because you know, like I said, it started. I think it was '88 or '89 when it when it first started airing. And but like I said, '90s was when it blew up. It was like a huge uh, phenomenal success. I used to work at Starbucks, and um, that this woman, uh, Katie um, Segal. Yeah, is it Katie Seagal? Is that is that her name? Not Seagal, but Seagal or Se I forget her. She came, yeah. she came into my line one time at Starbucks, 
And uh, I recognize her because I recognize her voice. She has a very distinct right. voice. And I think she voices Leela on Futurama, right? Yeah, she does. She does. And yep. so, so I recognized her voice immediately. And then I looked at her and she had like a kind of like a wrap on her head and like big sunglasses. Like she clearly like did not want people recognizing her. Or her. <laughs> right, yeah. And so <laughs> she, she ordered her coffee and I said, okay. And if Starbucks were trained, like, you know, you always yeah. ask, ask the person's name. Right. So I was like, okay, what's your name? And she said, Kate. And I said, okay, Kate, well, we'll have that for you in a minute. I didn't bug her. I didn't like, right. you know, fanboy or anything. Right. Um, right. And actually, I have to tell this. It's rare I get the opportunity to tell this story. Can I tell another Starbucks story? Go, go ahead. Go ahead, please. By all so means. I worked at the Brentwood Starbucks, which is like near Beverly Hills, you know, and like Harrison Ford came into our Starbucks. Steven Spielberg came in. Of course, they didn't come in the days I was working, right? Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but one time I was working and this older man walks in. Julius, you're going to love this story, okay? Okay. I'm like, Julius, I need your full attention, okay? <laughs> like, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. This older man walks in and he looks like Woody Allen. Uh -oh. And I think to myself, is this Woody Allen? But here we are in, <laughs> here we are in like, Southern California, and I'm thinking, well, Woody Allen lives in New York. I'm sure he comes to LA sometimes, right? Um, and I think to myself, this little old man looks like Woody Allen. Oh my goodness, is this Woody Allen? And then I thought, I'll know as soon as he opens his mouth whether yeah. he's <laughs> right. man walks up to me because I'm working in the register, All right? And he says, um, I have a dopio espresso for here, and I was like. <laughs> and and again at starbucks so clearly it's woody allen <clears throat> again at starbucks we're trained to always ask the name of the person right and i said okay what's your name sir and he goes ed <laughs> ed gets <laughs> ed i was like okay. ed huh okay ed <laughs> Woody Allen, the other Cosby. Yes, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, yes. Man, yes. we're just, you know, we should, we should just, the show should just be about people, canceled people. That's true. Because we end up talking I think about so. You know, because, you know, um, it's always conflicting, right? It's always conflicting when you have people that you, I don't want to say revere or, or worship, but more like, I guess, Admire. respect. It, yeah. it's, it's respect as, a, as an artist. You know, I always say respect because admiring is it's more of a I don't know. It's more of a of a worshiping thing. I'm not I'm not into that thing. I'm not I'm not I'm not into being starstruck anymore like I was ten years ago. Now I'm more like you're a human being. I'm a human being. We're both equal. Yeah, you do movies. You make this whatever, but that doesn't mean anything to sure. me anymore. Yeah, but I can still respect your work, your body of work. So it's always it's always very conflicting how, you know, people like Woody Allen, uh, Kevin Spacey, Bill Cosby, and and the list goes on and on, and it, it's just like oh man, like you did such such great work, your you have such great body of work. Now I can't, I it, I, I still want to appreciate it because it, it was it's great work, but now I can't, I, I just can't. You're you're it's like, it's like someone pooping in the pool. You know, right. like one or like putting the uh, turd in the in the punch bowl. You ruined the punch bowl, buddy. Like it was it was great punch, and you ruined it by putting a turd in there, you bastards. So, uh, yeah, it's just it's just tough, you know. And Woody Allen has done has made great films, fantastic films throughout his career. Um, I watched Blue Jasmine a few months ago with Blue Jasmine with uh, Kate uh, Kate Blanchett. I don't know if you've ever seen that one, Sean, or not. No, no, no. I remember. No, I don't think I've seen oh, that. Oh, man. Well, Kate Blanchett was freaking phenomenal in that film. Like, she. Okay. Like, if you had any doubts about her acting ability, you, you no longer had any doubts after watching Blue Jasmine because she just. She owned that role. And I was really impressed by it. And I was like, this freaking asshole, this freaking talented a hole. I can't believe you, man. <laughs> like, I can't believe you. I can't respect this body of work, but I, whatever. It's just one of those things that I'm, you know, I think that I'm not the only one who feels that way. There's a lot of people out there who, who also feel. I, you know. 
I mean, I was never a Woody Allen like. I never obsessed over him or anything or, or about his movies, but there was. Um, thank you, Happy Jam Jam. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I have more stories from that Starbucks, which I'll bring to you at another time. Um, yeah, please share those. Those those would be great. I have, oh, I, have great uh, I, I didn't I didn't have any doubts while they bought eighty eight. I just I, I just uh, I'm just saying it's just it's like a, a a saying, I guess you could say. You know, just a a, a, a phrase. You know, that if you if you had doubts about Kate Blanchett's uh, acting ability, there was no if after watching Blue Jasmine, then you wouldn't have any more doubts. I never had doubts about Kate Blanchett's acting ability. She's fantastic. I mean, she played Catherine Hepburn in, in Aviator. I mean, that was like. I, I honestly thought, and I'll let you get to your story, Sean, uh, but to, to your point, but I, I honestly thought Kate Blanchett was not going to pull off Catherine Hepburn. I seriously thought she was not going to do it. I was like, she ain't going to pull it off. No way. She's going to do the caricature that most you know comedians do, but she, again, she well, I was like, it. wow, she freaking, like, she, like, she's great. Yeah, after that, it. I was like, this Kate Blanchett is the shit. Like, she, she's, she's up there for sure. But go ahead, Sean. You're you're gonna finish your thought. Oh, I was just gonna say, but um, during like when I first really started getting into movies, of course, like I I saw some of his contemporary movies when I was like the movies that were coming out at that time, right. like Small Time Crooks, and I loved Small Time Crooks. Um, I it's probably my favorite Woody Allen movie just because it's super funny. Um, and then he came out with one with um the gal from Saved by the Bell, and I don't remember the name of the movie, um, something about em emerald sapphires or green, green something. The Curse of the Jade Scorpion. The Curse of the Jade Scorpion. Oh, um, yeah, I remember that movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, had some really, actually, one of my favorite Woody Allen jokes moments is in that movie where he's, he's like, he goes into someone's office and he's like looking through all their stuff. And, and they and they come in and they go, what are you doing? Why are you going through my stuff? And he goes, I just, I'm rummaging. I, I rummage. I'm a rummager. I just, I rummage. <laughs> like, like it's Sorry. just like part of his nature. He rummages. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, and then I went back and I watched um, the, the one with Diane Keaton. Um, what's the famous Annie one? Hall? Annie Hall. I watched that movie. I watched Manhattan and... Uh, oh yeah, that could be our our outshot Wild by eighty eight. I can tell the the the, the Luther story, um, but anyway, I digress. Um, he's a very good artist, but yeah, it's it's sad that yeah. Um, yeah. it's sad that um, artists aren't often good people. So yeah, right, exactly. And so, people aren't and people aren't often good people. No, general. you're right. They're not. It's just a matter of you know have some self control. For oh, other, and some but, professionalism you know, in terms yeah. of like you know what Woody Allen did, uh, that's a different whole different level right there. But I will say for the most part, you know, if you are what you are, then just I guess have some decency. I mean, what's so hard about yeah. having some decency, you know, and having some self respect and not only self respect but respect for others, you know, who who are working with you or who are who are going to be in a working relationship with you. So it's a, it's just a, for me, it's like, oh, it always boggles my mind as to why can't you practice that? Like, what's the point? Like, what's, did you not think you were going to get, you're not going to get caught at one point? Like, what, what was the, the deal here? You know, who knows? Who knows what these things, but. Or people feel like they're above it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. And that's the thing. Never meet your heroes. Don't make them into heroes in the first place. Just remind yourself they're people, they're human beings. And um, we're all corruptible. We all can be corruptible. You know, it's just a matter of what, how we, uh, how we decide to approach it. You know, so to end the show, and we'll we'll definitely continue this on in another episode because there's a lot to unpack in the '90s because '90s was chock full of sitcoms, favorite sitcoms. Um, some good, some not so good. In my opinion, yeah, because we're getting once we get in the '90s, it's like we're yeah. in our era, right? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. We're gonna have a exactly. lot to say about yeah, it. Yeah, a lot to say, a lot to talk about. So, the last one I want to uh, share with you guys that I think was is great. It's not underrated, and neither is it overrated. It's actually just right. And the show I'm talking about is uh, 
a show that was a staple of my childhood and my preteen years and my teen years. And that is Saved by the Bell. Ah, Curse of the Jade Scorpion. Yeah. Now, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Berkeley. Yeah, Elizabeth Berkeley. So I know this, this is another show like Mary with Children where it blew up in the 90s. It was more popular in the 90s than it was when it first came on the 80s. Um, but uh, this show for me was obviously there's obvious reasons why I love this show so much because it dealt with teenage life. And I was a teenager at the time, so I was able to totally identify with this show. You know, high school life, junior high school life, friends, friendship, betrayals, that kind of thing. And and uh, yeah, this this show definitely was my favorite of all time growing up. Um, Zach uh, Zach was a was a POS. Per, you know, not looking back on on the show, Zach, uh, uh, what's his last name? Uh, Morris. Zach Morris. I don't know if you guys ever seen the the shorts from Funny or Die called Zach Morris's Trash. If you guys have not seen that, tonight, if you got nothing to do, look it up. You will find them everywhere. It's either on Amazon Prime if you have Prime. Uh, they might be on YouTube if you search for them. I'm not sure. But look it, up Zach Morris's Trash. Real quick, it looks like Lisa Turtle is flipping the camera off. I know that's not what she's doing. I think she's snapping. She's snapping the fingers, yeah. <laughs> but it looks like she's like giving through on the finger. Um. Yeah, I loved the show. It was another one I watched with my brother and sister and by myself on Saturday mornings. And that was the other yeah. thing about this show is yeah. that it was a sitcom for kids that came right. on on Saturday mornings, like when cartoons usually came on right. or right after cartoons came on. So it was like our whole generation, even though it wasn't like a prime time hit show, right? right? Our whole generation grew up watching this show. Um, I had crushes on every single one of these girls. Like, yeah, um, yeah right. I think um, Elizabeth Berkeley's character, what was her character's name? Jesse. Jesse. Jesse Spano, Jesse. right? Jesse Spano, yep. Yeah, Jesse Spano <laughs> was my favorite because I loved how like she was smart. Yeah. And yeah. she was kind of a nerd and she was smart. Um, we oh Brad and I actually met uh may he may he rest in peace, God rest his soul. We met uh Dustin Diamond one time at Disneyland. Oh wow. Um yeah, that was a fun story. Um, and maybe that's the story I should end on. But but yeah, Julius, what did you what did you love about this show? Everything was funny. Uh, Belding, you know, was uh, Belding. <laughs> Belding was a great, uh, you know, okay. uh, I guess I would say protagonist to Zach's antagonist because Zach was. You know, back then, of course, I, I would think Zach was the coolest character on the show because he had, he got all the girls. He was popular. He was he was very cool. But now that I'm older, and you know, again, watching the Zach Morris's trash shorts from Funny or Die, you realize, oh, he really was a terrible. He, he was a terrible person. <laughs> he really was a terrible person. Like, oh my god, a sociopath. Um, a sociopath for sure. Um, AC Slater uh, was cool. I mean, I, I just <laughs> like. I love the fact that that they kept the show going and you got to see these characters grow. You know, we got to see them from their freshman year up until their senior year in high school. And I love that because it, it brought like a sense of like of almost like knowing these characters yourself personally. And that you could if you see them down the street, you could, you know, talk to them. But of course, it's, it's just fantasy. It's just make believe. Yeah. But. Yeah, um, you felt like they were your friends in school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that they're, you know. If you like I say, if you saw him down the street, you'd be like, "Hey, Kelly, how you doing? How you been?" <laughs> you know, the early version of the show also had Haley Mills in it. She played their teacher. Yes. Yeah, and, she was um, great. I'm surprised that they got rid of her in the new, uh, the latest when they went to high school. Yeah, they they changed because the the show was originally named like Good Morning Miss Swan or something like that. Mm, okay. Um. And it was really about her class, and they were like middle schoolers. Right. Yeah. But then it, but, it blew um, up to, to I guess the Zach Moore show, right? Say by the bell. <laughs> but you yeah. know what? It's fine. It's fine. You know, it it, it worked out. It worked oh, out yeah. because, like I said, you, it was it was a staple in our in our youth. You know how you asked me what I liked about F Troop, right. and it was like Mr. Belding, how he was the principal of the school, but he wasn't really in charge. Like Zach Morris was really in charge. Right. 
you know, kind of like Ferris Bueller, you know, yeah. um, like that's how F Troop was like the captain of the of the fort was like in charge, but he really wasn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so. So anyway, can I tell my Dustin Diamond story as my. Oh, uh, well, yeah, before you do, uh, I just want to remind everyone that we will be moving from Friday because, uh, um, you know, COVID's kind of going down. People are starting to feel more comfortable going out on Friday night. So I'm assuming people are not going to be home Friday nights anymore. So we're going to move the day um, Tuesday or Thursday. I don't know which of the two days. We'll get back to you on that. I'll make sure to tweet it out and I'll make sure to uh, and you know subscribe if you have not subscribed. Uh, hit the notification bell so that way when we do change days, you know exactly which day we're on. That's the beautiful thing about subscribing to Talking Cinema. Uh, we'll have more sh content like this. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I, I didn't think we we're going to dive deep into our love of sitcoms and how much sitcoms really have played a role in our in our lives, in our American lives. The fact that we know so much about sitcoms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised no. that we know a lot about sit uh, sitcoms as much as cinema. So uh, we might do this again. We might explore certain series, but well, you know, just throwing things out there. But uh, for the future, just remember, guys, uh, to subscribe, hit the like button, leave a comment, and hit the notification bell so that way you know when we move to our new days, you'll know which days we're gonna we're gonna move to. So, um, with that said, I would lastly like to say about the show what I loved about it was um, it, it almost had like a it was a slice of real life. Okay. Um, you had uh, the nerd Screech always chasing Lisa, and Lisa just denying him left mm -hmm. and right. And uh, Screech was definitely a guy I could relate to. I uh, related to him too. High school, you know, because yeah. there's definitely a, a few girls in my lifetime that I liked and they didn't like me back, and I would pursue them. But unlike Screech, I would stop when they said no. <laughs> so <laughs> Screech, Screech was kind of a creeper towards Lisa because, you know, Lisa would tell him no and he still kept going for her. He still went after her no matter what. So mm. um, also I did like he was persistent. The, it was, he was persistent, but still it was kind of like, dude, she's not interested. Move on. And eventually he did. He found a, a girlfriend in Tori Spelling. If you remember, Tori Spelling was a guest uh, star of that show. Uh, I think for I forget what season it was, but she played his his uh, girlfriend. Um, I also liked that the AC Slater and Zach will always bump, sometimes bump heads. Uh huh. And, yeah. You know, the breakup between Kelly and and Zach, and also how they grew apart, and that kind of it, it was just it was just great all around. It was just really gave you like a slice of what real life can be, of what can what can become when you are growing up and you starting to become an adult, and that is you're gonna get go through heartbreak, pain, um, betrayal, and also some crazy wild antics that some troublemaking kid is gonna get you know get you involved in so <laughs> there was that element too that i liked but um go ahead tell us your dustin diamond story that you met at the disneyland so we're kids brad's probably 13 or 14 no he's probably 16 my sister's probably 13 i'm probably 10 right oh wow so okay All right. and we're we're at the my my parents we used to come out here to disney to to california to vacation because we i grew up in arizona and my parents we were at the disneyland hotel we always came to the disneyland hotel the first day of our vacation because it was free you didn't have to pay to get into the disneyland hotel we could just walk around you know right. so my parents though it was like their anniversary or something and they were going to go have a nice dinner for their anniversary and they told us kids like here, um, you know, here's here's some money. Go get some dinner at they used to be this place called the Monorail Cafe, and it was oh yeah, it was like oh, a place. yeah, it was a diner. It was just a diner, yeah. and it was like up up on top where the monorail was. And right. we loved that place. Like I was so sad when they took that place out. One of one of our Disney places, but so we go in there. You know, we're these three siblings, no parents. <laughs> and uh, we order our food and we go sit down and then this family comes in and they're coming in the door and this guy looks exactly like Screech from Say by the Bell. And, you know, the three of us kids are like, is that Screech? Screech? No, I can't be Screech. You know? <laughs> so then my brother, my brother, who's who's not uh, he's typically more shy than this, my brother. Uh, so this is a little out of character for him. 
my brother yells out across the restaurant, Screech! <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, I'm too far away. So then, and then, and then Dustin Diamond, Dustin Diamond, poor Dustin Diamond just looks up and he goes, and he just keeps, you know, walking to get his food. But he, he acknowledged oh. us. He was like, he was like, oh yeah, hey, I'm Screech. And then he just kept walking. And I was like, Dustin Diamond, man, Screech. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty bold of your brother. Screech. <laughs> I'm sure he loved that. <laughs> he looked like he didn't love it, but no, yeah. he, uh, from what I've read and from my, what I've uh, seen and the interviews he's given over the years, he hated it. He hated the fact that he would walk down the street yeah. and people would call him Screech. Well, and you know, yeah. you know, he had some, you know, he had some troubles in life. And yeah. I'd like to oh, think yeah. my, I think my brother, I'd like to think my brother was at least partially responsible for some of his problems. Maybe, maybe it triggered something where he's like, oh, I can't believe him. That was the last <laughs> straw for Dustin Diamond. Yeah. No, let's it, hope it not. broke him. It broke him. It broke yeah. Dustin Diamond. Good for you, Brad. Good job, Good. Brad. Remember I sent him an apology oh. postcard he did? <laughs> I don't remember that, Brad. <laughs> okay, I do kind of remember that now. That'd be awesome if he did. If he did that, that would be great if he had done that. That is my brother yeah. to a T. My brother is the most thoughtful person you can imagine. So, You know, and yeah. you can't. I can't really blame your brother either because when you're kids, you don't know the, the actress's name. You go by the character's name. Screech. You always go. It's always the that's always the case. That's unfortunate. That's that's the the stigma actors get when they become famous. Is that you're you're forever going to be that character if you don't break that mold. Now, it, you know some actors do transcend where you do remember their names. But if you're a television actor who never reaches yeah. outside that television aspect, then you're never going. No one's going to know your name. They're going to remember you as the character of that show. It's nice now that we have cell phones there because like if you see someone you recognize, you're like, oh, and you look them up real quick, then you can go up to them. Oh, Mr. Right. So and So, I love your work and such and such. Or, or what they do is they you get your phone out, and you start recording them. <laughs> you start recording them and like, hey, I love your work, and they love that too when you record them. Uh, word of advice to all you people out there: If you see celebrities, don't ever, ever record them because it's rude, and you wouldn't like it if someone did it to you. So just and and the thing you're doing is the thing they literally get paid thousands. Yeah, or exactly. Of so they for. they need to get paid. They need to get paid <laughs> if you're gonna record them. So, um, but that's it. All right, I think that's all right, buddy. the the entire thing. So, um, uh, we'll definitely uh do a part two for this. Uh, we'll cover the nineties and maybe early two thousands. Cause I'm pretty sure there's a few sitcoms in two thousands that came out that were, that were really good. Uh, but that was around the time when I stopped watching sitcoms was around two thousands because I kind of got burnt out. I've got, I can, I can, I can roll with even up into the modern day with single camera sitcoms with certain ones. Um, multi, multi camera sitcoms. I definitely, after like after the 90s or the 2000s i i i, I like i never watched big bang theory or how i met your mother or any of that yeah stuff. same here same here i never i never have to. i think the last one well we'll talk more about that but yeah, yeah that's that's another another another, another topic edition. for another, another stream so yeah. uh, watch out for that guys don't remember don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel talking cinema if you want to know more about the history of cinema and you know breaking down films and sitcoms now because uh we've had so much fun i think we're going to continue doing this because uh i mean come on why not right and uh, uh fresh prince uh brad that's 90s that's the next episode we'll probably more likely talk about that show um when yeah. we get to the 90s like i said it was an explosion of sitcoms in the 90s just everywhere it was it was you couldn't i mean it, anyone who's anyone was how was in the sitcom so uh ryan thanks for showing up uh thank you for the kind words yeah it was a great show it was fun Thanks, buddy. So, um, yeah, so like I said, if you guys want are interested in, in hearing about our opinions about films or breaking down films, uh, be it uh, uh, constructive or symbolic or even the uh, practical side, the the creative side, like what Sean does as a cinematographer, breaking down certain how how certain you know, scenes were sh shot and lit. 
with certain kind of lenses. You know, join us at Talking Cinema, and we'll talk. We'll discuss every form of topics. It doesn't really matter. And uh, don't forget to, uh, like I said, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, leave a comment, and we'll be moving to either Tuesdays or Thursdays, depending. So hit the notification bell so you can know when days will uh, will will show up, and then you could watch us again. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Anything else you want to add, Sean, before we call it a night? I think I'm good. We're definitely talking about Seinfeld next time. Yeah, Seinfeld will definitely be, a, I think, a big topic of discussion. Smell you later. <laughs> Go home. Smell you later. <laughs> Wait, what's that from? Oh, yeah. Welcome to my kingdom. Fresh I was finally Fresh there. Fresh. Yo, home. Smell you later. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have fun with that one. Actually, yeah. all right, guys. Yeah, we'll, we'll have we'll have Brad back to talk about that one. Maybe yeah, we can have yeah, Brad we'll, as a guest because we'll, Brad we'll, Brad loves that show. Yeah, we'll we'll have you on, Brad, and then you could you know come in as quickly as a guest, and you could give your your two cents on Fresh Prince, and I'm pretty sure on other other great shows that came out in the '90s. So with that said, guys, you have a safe weekend. Stay safe out there. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Uh, be uh, that's be it. Good. That's all I have. As ET once said. Be good. Be good. <laughs> See you guys. Take care. I hit the wrong button, guys. Sorry. <laughs>